Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started now with our program. Uh, my name is Anessa Morley, and I'm the executive director of the Wayne State University Alumni Association. And the Alumni Association is proud to partner with the Urban D. Reed Honors College for this evening's Arthur L. Johnson Urban Perspectives Lecture Series. And we're especially proud to highlight the iDetroit project. This lecture series began in 1992 and is named in honor of the civil rights leader and former Wayne State Administrator, Arthur L. Johnson. Until his passing in 2011, Dr. Johnson was dedicated to uplifting his fellow man and the greater community. His decades of work and countless contributions to society have left a le lasting legacy, celebrated by this impactful lecture series. In addition to our guest panelists on stage, we know that we have two very special guests joining us on the virtual side, um, Chicana Bao, widow of Arthur L. Johnson and a true Wayne State supporter and her husband, Harold. So I want to say a special thank you to both of them for attending. And now I'd like to introduce Wayne State University Board of Governor member, Brian Barnhill. Brian is also a participant of the I Detroit Project. Brian is a purposeful leader with a passion for bringing transformational impact to systems and organizations. He currently works in Ford Smart Mobility City Solutions Group where he plays a critical role in shaping the creation of Ford's urban ecosystem for mobility innovation in the city of Detroit. Brian, I'm happy to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping you weren't gonna go through the whole bio, so <laughs> wishes do come true. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to welcome you here this afternoon. You know, I've often heard of the city of Detroit referred to as a, a big city with a small town feel. Um, and indeed, you know, we come from a place, those of us who are from the city, that is culturally, historically significant enough uh, to stand its weight against some of the uh, famous cities all across the world. But it's small enough for me to have gone to high school with uh, one of the panelists here uh, I'll let him uh, share uh, exactly uh, who he is in, in that story if, if uh, it gets to that point. Uh, but in that sense, I, I feel like it's very appropriate for the city of Detroit to be uh, the second city selected for uh, a project like I Detroit. It features uh, a group of amazing individuals who are doing very impactful things in our community um, that I truly believe will resonate across the globe. Uh, but at the same time, as you read the, the, the narratives, uh, understand the stories, you'll not only see uh, where they come from across the globe, their makeup, uh, where they're from the city, but perhaps understand a little bit about how we all may be connected to each other. So with that said, Let's get started with the uh, discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm John Corvino. I'm Dean of the Urban D. Reed Honors College. It's my pleasure to welcome you, uh, both those in the live audience present and those watching from home to the Arthur L. Johnson Urban Perspectives Lecture. Um, I was very excited about this particular program because the Urban D. Reed Honors College at Wayne State University has a rich tradition of thoughtful engagement with the city. And that tradition was initiated by my predecessor, the founding dean of the college, Dean Emeritus Jerry Heron, and I want to acknowledge his presence in the audience today. I want to uh, thank the Alumni Association for partnering with the Honors College on today's program. I want to thank um, all of the folks from Media Communications who are helping with the behind the scenes stuff and our live feed for all the people watching at home. Uh, I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Beth Fowler and Dr. Brian Ellis. Um, Beth and Brian are actually teaching a course right now, a foundational seminar in the Honors College based in the iDetroit project. 
And we thought it would be really exciting not just to share this with our students, but share this with the larger community. And today's event is a nice opportunity to do that. Uh, and I also want to thank Marcus Lyon. Uh, Marcus is the artist who initiated this project. And it is a difficult project to describe. It is a book of photographic portraits. It is a genealogy project. It is an interactive video display. I had a student in my office yesterday, a high school senior who is coming to the Honors College in the fall, and I showed him the book, and he started flipping through it, and he pulled out his phone, and he's like, oh, this is really cool. I'm like, what are you doing with your phone? He's like, oh, no, there's this, I just downloaded the app, and there's this interactive thing you could do. It takes me that long to, like, remember the password to download a, an app. So I, you know, um, I, I was imp impressed by what young people can do. Um, but in terms of describing the project to you, there's probably no better person to do that than Marcus Lyon himself. And while Marcus could not be here today, he did want to send a video greeting. So let me share that with you right now. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, John. It's a real privilege to be here at the Arthur Johnson Urban Perspectives Lecture. So I'm Marcus Lyon and I create human atlases. And what are human atlases? Well, they are deep dive, research-based projects that explore the human capital of a defined geography through a group of nominated change agents. So the Christie Foundation, Rick Rapson and Wendy Jackson, invited myself and my team to come to Detroit to create High Detroit, a human atlas of an American city. Now this work allowed us to come and witness the real narrative of the city because we create those human atlases through the three pillars of portraits, oral histories, and ancestral DNA mapping. So together we came and we got the opportunity to have this really extraordinary journey to listen to and understand the deeper stories of how the city of Detroit has created significant social change in the previous decades. We spent six months building a nomination process where a whole host of key individuals through the city were nominated to be part of the project. And then we came and we recorded their stories, we listened to their stories. We built a book, we're creating podcasts, we're doing projection mapping exhibitions on the exteriors of large scale buildings. And we'll be bringing all of that back to Detroit in the coming years. So for today, it's my great privilege to introduce to you Tiffany, Hannah, Chase, Kwaku, and Detroit's most important Marcus, Marcus Elliott, who's with you there in the panel. I'm so sorry I couldn't be with you today, but we're in California creating our new human atlas, the human atlas of Silicon Valley. So for now, have a great lecture, and thank you for your time. Okay, we are still waiting on one of our panelists, but uh, I am told he is on his way. Um, and let me um, take a moment to acknowledge Governor Dana Thompson in, in the audience. Um, so thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. I know um, it's, it's not the nicest day outside. Uh, so I appreciate your, your getting here and finding parking and, 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 and all of that. Um, I would like to start by giving you each an opportunity to introduce yourselves, say a little bit about who you are and the work you do in Detroit, starting with Hanan. Work our way back. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hanan Yahya, uh, project manager uh, with uh, the Joe Louis Greenway, which is a city of Detroit project. I've been working for the city for a few years now. I transitioned into this role from my role with Detroit City Council. I was working for council member Castaneda Lopez, who represents District 6, which is represented in this um, 
which she used to represent uh, uh, Wayne State University at the time. So I was with her for the second duration of her term, and now I transitioned into uh, leading um, one of, I think, uh, the best projects in the city right now, which I'm very blessed to have. Uh, in terms of background, I um, was born in Yemen and moved to the States at the age of three with my family. Um, so first generation uh, immigrant uh, and Detroiter here. Um, been living in the city f for my entire life, uh, except for the portion where I studied at University of Michigan. I studied urban studies and entrepreneurship and then returned back to the city because uh, my heart has always been with the city. Uh, so I don't know if I mentioned the part about being raised in Southwest Detroit, but that is a huge part of my identity. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tiffany. Good afternoon. Is it afternoon or evening? <laughs> I'm Tiffany Brown. That clock stopped at 9 o'clock or quarter to 9 yeah, at some like, point. Uh, it looks I, I like it's 8.45. 8.45. It's 8.45 somewhere. Um, so I'm Tiffany Brown. Uh, I am um, NOMA. NOMA is an acronym for the National Organization of, Mo of Minority Architects. I'm the executive director of NOMA. We are based in DC. So I belonged to the board for a number of years and then um, I took a job as executive director. Before that, I was a project manager at an architecture and engineering firm called Smith Group, which is also headquartered here in, De in Detroit. Um, I grew up here. Um, this is where I was born and raised. A little bo more about my background. I also have a, my own nonprofit called 400 Forward, where I teach girls uh, about architecture and design and other STEM-related fields. Um, and I attended Lawrence Technological University for two degrees in architecture and an MBA, which led me to um, the, the business end of architecture for the most part. So. Um, I'm an advocate for an MBA. Some people are like, you know, you can do what you want without that. But um, yeah, it was something that really uh, pushed me toward um, away, not away from architecture, but just more into the city, more into learning about um, business development in the city. Uh, I was doing business development in architecture firms before I took the ED job. But um, yeah, just happy to be part of the ID Detroit project. And it was a really cool book, and I hope that you guys um, are lucky enough to win a copy or that you will purchase a copy. But yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chase. All right, I'm Chase Cantrell. I, like everyone on the stage, I'm a proud Detroiter. Um, and for those of you, you know, we all know how uh, we all talk about the different sides of Detroit. I'm a proud West Sider as well. Um, Brian mentioned earlier high school, so yes, Renaissance High School, Mighty Phoenix. <laughs> um, also son of David and Catherine, and as parents do, I think my parents are watching, which is wonderful. Um, <laughs> I'm also the executive director of a nonprofit based here in Detroit called Building Community Value, which teaches real estate development to Detroiters who want to transform their communities. So we've been doing that for about six years. I'm also a recovering attorney. I used to practice real estate and corporate law, which led me to where I am now as well as a for-profit developer. So I currently live on the west side in a neighborhood called Bagley, and I'm doing commercial development on Six Mile, which is the mile road that I grew up, grew up off of. So trying to give back to the community that, uh, that raised me. And you know, Marcus and I were talking about teaching. This is my first semester teaching at the University of Michigan, which is you know, also nice to go back to my alma mater to, to do that. So uh, lots, of, lots of different hats. But it was, uh, it was very wonderful being included in the Detroit Project. Um, learned a lot about people who I care deeply about. So it was a wonderful way for me to learn more. And uh, you know, gave one to my, to my parents and to my nieces. And you know, I just wanted my family to be able to take part in it too. So it's a great way, even for us Detroiters, to learn more about the city that we love. Thank you. And Marcus, who is apparently the best Marcus. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> According to Marcus Lyon. Right, right. Hey, everyone. My name is Marcus Elliott. I am a saxophonist, composer, and educator. Uh, I uh, did not actually grow up in Detroit. I grew up out in the suburbs, but I am uh, both on my mom and, and dad's side, uh, I am the third generation Detroiter to come, to come back living in Detroit now. And I live also on the west side. Uh, I live in Grandmont Rosedale area. Um, which is also where uh, my mom's side, most of my family lives over there. So 
Um, but I grew, uh, uh, as I was growing up, I was uh, constantly coming to Detroit to visit family and also to see music. My, my father was a music lover and uh, he would take me to jazz clubs probably way too young, at a way too young of an age to, to be there. But he was like, come on, you gotta, you know, gotta, you gotta be a part of this because he knew I was into music. And I just fell in love with it, fell in love with the music, uh, uh, got to meet some mentors and some musicians uh, that I still work with to, uh, to this day. And uh, ended up going to Michigan State University to do my undergrad, graduated there, and instead of most of the people that I graduated with, you know, everybody's either going to New York or LA, um, but something told me I had to come back here in Detroit and uh, continue the work that I knew needed, that I felt I, I wanted to do. So that's what I did, and I'm happy I did it. It's a wonderful decision. I've been able to uh, not only do a lot of amazing projects here in Detroit, but able to travel the world and uh, play on an international level. Um, and I currently uh, just started this past semester. I am teaching at Wayne State University. So um, very happy to be here and yeah. Excellent. And I'm sorry to put you on the spot right away, but Kwaku, welcome. Hi, hi. <laughs> sorry I'm late. I got pulled over on the way here trying to be on time. Oh, no. Used to driving up in Ottawa where there's barely a speed limit. Um, but unfortunately, there is one here. So, um, but I made it. Um, hi, I'm Kwaku Osebonsu. Um, born here um, in Michigan. Lathrop graduate, proud Lathrop graduate and Howard grad, but doing work primarily on the east side of Detroit through East Eats. Um, which is an outdoor dining club, um, primarily comprised of 12 geodesic domes um, that was brought to life in the middle of the, of the pandemic. And so um, prior to that, uh, my main work was Detroit Black Restaurant Week, as well as um, I'm a now, <laughs> I call myself a retired teacher, but I put three years in the game and it felt like 30. So, <laughs> so um, that, that took me on to other things. and. Um, my students continue to inspire me, and uh, full circle moments continue to happen where a lot of my students ended up also being staff at my restaurant. And so now moving on to Idlewild, which is another place that I'm very passionate about. Um, we've opened Idlewild Eats there, which is um, also comprised of geodesic domes, but is housed at Morton's Historic Motel. Um, and then we also run the Roadrunner Convenience and Variety Store, which is in Idlewild. So our primary goal is to bring infrastructure back to a historically black space um, to continue to bring life um, into that space. Excellent. Thank you. So you are all part of the I Detroit project. And a few years ago, some British guy comes and says he wants to profile 100 Detroiters what went through your mind when you heard about that? I would like to jump in. Please. <laughs> um, because he didn't uh, only ask that we be part of this book, he asked for our DNA. And I was like, what, who is this man from another country that wants my DNA? You know, so I was very resistant to that. Um, you know, and it's, I, I think it's something that we probably all thought about, but I had not done um, ancestry yet, but I was thinking about doing it, and he was telling me about the process. So uh, it took a couple nudges from him, a couple phone calls from him, a couple people to convince me to do it, but I'm glad that I did. So um, if I can represent my city, also a West Sider, I forgot to mention that, um, in any way, uh, especially in a, a positive light um, regarding social advocacy and uh, just letting the world see who we are, then, you know, I eventually came around to it. Thanks. Anyone else? So it's interesting. Um, so you cited the Kresge Foundation earlier. And, you know, I, I deal with philanthropy a lot in my work. And in fact, there were uh, ph philanthropic organizations nationally are very interested in Detroit. There were actually 11 foundation heads that were visiting the past three days, including Ford, Kresge, Bloomberg, et cetera. So for years, I've been like thinking through the ways that philanthropy enter community and what they do. And part of the history of this is, you know, Rip Rapsom saying, seeing, seeing this art piece, it is a very beautiful piece. It's not just a book, right? Seeing this elsewhere 
and saying, we need to bring that to Detroit. Um, so when I heard that, I was initially skeptical, not just about the DNA, but about the funding source, saying, well, you know, it's one thing to fund art, but it's another thing to, you know, want my voice, want my likeness, want my DNA, et cetera. Um, but Marcus has a way of convincing people because he entered community correctly, right? He talked to the right people, he took his time. You know, I think probably all of us had the question of how do we get nominated for this? He had that information, he was willing to share it. So he was, he was doing all the right things. Um, so that sort of assuaged my fears a little bit. And you know, once we see the final product, it is something that's amazing. Yeah, and it's, it was a six month process, right? Where he yeah. interviewed many, many Detroiters yeah. to figure out who the 100 people would be. Exactly. I think I also, my initial reaction was like, why me, you know, um, in, a, in a positive way, you know, because there are tons and tons of people in Detroit doing excellent work. And this was a few years ago. I was in my early 20s. I think I'm like the second youngest person in the book. And I'm, but I think when I looked at it from another perspective, is um, it's an opportunity for me to represent my community. Uh, which is often overlooked. I mean, the area that I grew up in, the neighborhood in Southwest, uh, which is, you know, off of Michigan and Lanio, if you all are familiar, near the former Chatsy High, which no longer exists. Um, I wanted to represent, you know, that area and the stories of the immigrant community, and I think that's very powerful in and of itself. But my skepticism about Marcus and the project was very much rooted in how is this going to benefit Detroiters? You know, where is this going to live? You know, how is this really going to make an impact? And I think this is how I'm able to sit next to these incredible people and just have hard eyes because, you know, these are people I share a city with, people who, you know, I stand on the shoulders of because they've been doing the work for decades, uh, just for inspiration and for inner community dialogue and all that good stuff. So I think yeah, I was also convinced at some point. I know Marcus talked about how th this is not just a book, and you, you mentioned this, but it can be done as a museum exhibit. It, it's, it can be done as an interactive online exhibit. Do you know, does any of you know if there are plans to bring it um, anytime soon for a museum exhibit here? There's been discussion of it. I, th I think COVID probably put a wrench in, in some of that. We were supposed to be at the Charles Wright Museum on display there and then COVID hit. So yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure what or when things will happen here, but Marcus has continued to put this book and the findings and everything about it on display in other parts of the world. So he's definitely gonna try to do something back in the city again, just not sure when. Well, the fact that he took the time actually to do that video when he, first of all, first of all he hadn't been feeling well and then he was in Cal he's in California doing another project, so, so he, he's definitely committed to the I Detroit. Um, the, Guiding theme for today's discussion was what does it mean to engage thoughtfully with a city? And I'm curious what each of you have as thoughts on that question. What does that mean to you to engage thoughtfully with a city? I think that ties perfectly um, into the initial question that you asked of if there was uh, any skepticism or any concern around the book. I think that um, it's important that in, in engaging with the city that you're thorough, right? And so one of my largest concerns was if you're highlighting me, then who else? Because I'm, at the time, I was 26, you know, so I'm like, wait, no, who, who else? You know, so I was really, my first thing was like, let's see the list, you know, let's see who you're including just to make sure that this is a project that not only I wanna be a part of, but that I should be supporting. And upon seeing that, I was, I, I was like, okay, okay, this is a very, a very thorough examination of the people that exist here. Um, and I think that that, to answer your question, I think that that is um, where you begin, um, is in research and making sure that you're actually telling the story of, from a well-rounded perspective, um, a holistic perspective. So thoughtfully engaging the city has always been something that I've been asked to speak on and I've been on a couple panels and just it's something that is important to me um, because it goes even further than community engagement. It goes even further than just coming with the intention on gathering information for a book because that was also my concern. Like, are you going to sell this book? You know, and so how are you gathering the information and where are the proceeds going and how is it being funded? I had all the same questions that Chase had. 
Um, but thoughtfully engaging means coming and really understanding and getting down to the nitty gritty of things here. Um, it's not all shiny new downtown storefront buildings. Uh, you know, it's coming into my neighborhood where I grew up on Joy Road. Um, just one street over, you might, uh, if you're downtown, you've got these nice houses, McMansions is what I call some of them, newly renovated historic uh, homes, half a million dollars on the next block, whole row of vacant houses, on the next block from there, public housing. So um, whenever someone's coming to Detroit to do any type of research and I end up with them, um, I take them to the nice parts and I take them to the bad parts because that really is what embodies our city. It's the good and the bad. Uh, it is not just about a, a story and just kind of talking about the culture that made Detroit what it is. So the way that, the approach that Marcus took in getting the information, really understanding and going to my grandmother's house and just sitting on her porch and, you know, like he really did like all these things to understand who we were. So. I think that's meaningful for me. Like you really can understand when someone is just kind of there for personal gain or because some boss sent them, like especially Detroiters. So um, that's what thoughtfully engaging means to me, the way he approached the project. Yeah, I uh, um, first interacting with Marcus on this book, uh, just to kind of go back to your original question, because I think it all it does all kind of tie in. Um, I was very skeptical and uh, really wanted to hear and listen to what he has to say. Um, and what I found out is that he wanted to listen to what I had to say, and he wanted to listen to what the city had to say. And so, as a as a musician and as an artist, I value listening very much, and I feel that. Uh, it's a it's a skill that our musicians have to really develop. Is like when you're on the bandstand, it's like are you are you listening? What are you listening for? What are your intentions behind your listening? What do you have to say? And is it informed by what you're listening to? You're kind of at, you're in a situation where you have to answer all those questions. And so when I sat with him, I I saw that he was here to really create something meaningful and something that was lasting, not just to kind of get a quick buck because you can stamp Detroit on a, any sort of book now and is, you're going you're gonna to sell some copies. But that wasn't his intention and that was really clear. So um, I think engaging anything, a big, big part of it is that you have to listen. You have to listen to, to what's going on and, and really sit with it and have the patience and not look for answers or solutions right away um, to really experience what it is. So listening and patience. And so whether real estate development, whether architecture, whether urban planning, um, you know, we use the word engagement so much in Detroit and residents are being almost over engaged, right? People are entering community all the time, seeking opinions, um, you know, coming up with visions for change, but only, only entering community just for a brief moment just to extract something, then going off and doing the change that they want to see. And, you know, I, you know, real estate developers use the word community engagement all the time. And I try to step back and say, can we use, can we not only use a different term, but can we think of it differently to, in the way that everyone described is relationship building, right? It's not as though you're just extracting something. It's not a transactional action. It's really getting to know people. And Marcus is the perfect example. Like he really wanted to get to know us. And we, we actually have a WhatsApp group that occasionally we all still post in from time to time. And it's clear that he, he does still care about the relationships that he created. Um, should so, we send him a selfie? <laughs> <laughs> he'd, he'd probably appreciate that. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's not something extractional. It, it really is something that takes time. And you know, for a lot of these processes, time is money. Like you want, like if you are looking at any sort of project where there's a time element, there's a cost element. Most people are saying, I just need to get the information and get out. But relationship building really is the most important thing. It's huge. Yeah. How much of that is, is a part of, I mean, your, your organization is called Building Community Value, but is it a lot about relationship building as well? It, it is. So it's, it's, although that, that, that name wasn't popular when I first posited it, right? But it's about buildings, it's about community, and it's about value. So we, we talk about all those three things in the training. Um, but 
the, the folks who are in the class are from Detroit neighborhoods, right? So they already have relationships because they are part of community. But, you know, the questions do come up, like what short, sort of conversation should we be having? How do we develop relationships? What should we be saying to community? How can we be transparent? So just, just from a foundational uh, teaching perspective, I'm trying to let people know that there's actually an economic benefit to, to building relationships. It's not just, you know, it, the, 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 the time component of being fast doesn't actually benefit you in the long run, right? You actually, if you're building along a commercial corridor, the more relationships you build and the deeper the relationships, the more you're actually building patrons who will patron the, the commercial enterprises that are in those, those buildings. Um, so I think on many, many levels it has benefits. And uh, as, as I unpack that with, with students, you know, usually, uh, there's an understanding about that because they themselves, as Detroiters, know what it feels like to uh, to have that sort of just fast transactional approach. I, I want to talk more about the sort of ethos of Detroit as a place to build relationships. Um, I, I, I'm in a kind of, kind of weird position in that uh, I, I didn't grow up here. I grew up in New York, but I've been here for 24 years and lived in the city that entire time. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm not fully an outsider, but I'm, I'm, I'm not a, originally a Detroiter, uh, and, and so I bridge that. But I do think that there, when, when I came here, that there was a sense that you know, Detroiters are pretty friendly people, they, they, they're, they're, they're very practical people, they want to help, they, 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 uh, and um, I, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on that as a characterization of Detroit. I mean, do you think it's a particularly good place to build connections, build relationships? Do you think there are unique challenges to doing that here? I think with anything in the city, there will be challenges, uh, and that includes engagement, uh, and includes what you're, how you're defining or characterizing Detroiters. But just kind of to touch on the question before and piggyback on this question is, um, I think what we all can agree on is that Detroiters deserve healing. You know, they, they deserve an opportunity to, to share their stories. And I think whenever we're, we are doing engagement, um, and I know my role is very specific to the city and my project manager role, but I've been a community organizer and we all have been in several capacities, right? Um, but I think, you know, it, it's really understanding the history that has brought us to this moment you know, why has Detroit faced such challenges? I think, you know, going back to urban renewal projects all the way to some active urban trauma that's taking place as well, I think, is we need to give Detroiters that space to heal, you know. So when you're engaging them, there will be a lot of anger, I should say, right? Uh, because of what's consistently being done to us and to our communities um, in the past and in the present. So I think of it as a holistic approach, holistic healing, holistic engagement, um, and proactive engagement. It can be transactional, like Chase was saying. Uh, it needs to be long-term. People need to really be invested in people's lives. These are people's lives. These are neighborhoods that they grew up and live in and have taken care of when the city didn't, when people didn't, you know? And so I think Detroiters have been failed many times, but they are very practical, resilient people um, with a lot of rich contributions. And, and I think, you know, moving forward, uh, whether it's the city or people doing the work on the ground, it's really about preserving that space, pre preserving black history contributions, and in addition to that, you know, um, you know, allowing space for growth as well. Yeah. John, what's been your experience with Detroiters, as someone who's moved here from New York, like how? What's your perception? Just curious. Before I elaborate, so um, I should say I moved here from Austin, Texas, which is where I did where I did my PhD, and I loved Austin. I thought I was going to hate anywhere I went after Austin because I loved Austin so much, and I came here and I really enjoyed Detroit. And part of that was a real willingness of people to. Um, introduced me to other people. Um, you know, I, I came to Detroit as a 29-year-old gay man with a temporary job here at Wayne State. I was a temporary lecturer at the time and lived downtown at a time when, 
you know, there wasn't much in terms of like, if you wanted to go out to a restaurant after hours, it was, it was Greek town, and, and I mean, there was the Coney Islands, and, uh, but uh, it, was a very, it was a very different downtown. It tended to empty out at, at, at six o'clock. Um, and I, I found people very willing to connect me with other people and introduce me to other people, and that was true here at Wayne State, and that was true elsewhere. Um, I know not everybody has had that experience, but I was very grateful for that experience. I do ask because um, I know that, like you said, not everyone has had that experience. Um, people moving here from much larger cities uh, are seen, they, they seem to outnumber authentic Detroiters, you know? So um, the urban trauma that's happened and has been happening here, and we have watched it happen in other cities. If I do like go to a place like Brooklyn or Oakland, it makes me uh, a little bit upset because I, I can see what has happened there, happening here. So um, I'm always interested in knowing the feedback from other people, people who've moved here, because as someone that, um, that was born and raised here and when I travel, if someone asks me where I'm from and I say Detroit, they wanna know where I'm really from because pretty much everybody in Detroit now is not from Detroit. Right. So it's like you're, you're having to explain that you are actually from here. Um, and with my experience with growing up here and, and being in the industry that I'm working in, where now I'm on, um, not only am I a user of this kind of like built environment that was uh, a little bit hostile and you know, not the nicest neighborhood to grow up in, and now I'm on the other side of the table to create those types of spaces, listening to feedback from, from people, some of them are my family still. Um, and being part of a team where that team doesn't look like the people in that neighborhood uh, or the team that is there to serve this neighborhood comes from an office that has sent out people that look like them. You know, like it's, it really is just about uh, the, it's about the approach and it's about this person genuinely wanting to just be ingrained like with this city. We are a very proud city and a very, um, resistant to, I'm trying to put this in a way where it's not, you know. <laughs> Just keep <laughs> but, it real, keep it real. Um, I'll, I'll keep it real? Okay, that's why people ask me to come speak on um, these types of panels. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's not the easiest, to, it's, it's like we've, this experience we've had where people from other cities are swooping in with capes to save us. Mm -hmm. Detroit needs to be saved. We don't feel that way, but other people do. And that has been the experience with people moving here from other cities where they're coming to build here or they're coming to buy homes here that have been renovated uh, and now priced in a way where Detroiters can't, like have never had that capital to be able to buy a half a million dollar house that was just on a block where it was all vacant, you know? So it's, there's, you know, there's good feelings there and there's bad feelings there. Um, and there's just feelings of being guarded you know. Would you say a lot of the work that you all do is to try to empower Detroiters to not sort of get caught up in that resentment, but instead to, 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 be, to, have the, to find the capital to do something constructive? I mean, I, I know you do that in various different ways, but it seems like a, a big part of what you do. So it's inter interesting when you made the introduction in uh, Marcus's, Marcus's video, he talked about human capital and defined geographies, right? So part of, part of my work, and I think many of our, uh, uh, the work that we do, is to help people understand what their agency is, right? So if you think about all the harms that we're talking about over time, like you begin to lose hope, right? You begin to lose that thing that you need to be able to vision a future for yourself, for your family, for your community. Um, so a lot of that takes a lot of work of unlearning the things that we've, that we've taken in, right? Um, part of what's beautiful about the book is that you see a hundred doers, right, who aren't bogged down. You know, we, all, we all have this similar traumas and, and, and harms because we have lived through those things, but being able to rise above those and vision for the future and actually create the future, that's what architects do, right? That's what, that's what developers do, that's what creatives do. Like, so um, it's also being able to serve as examples, saying, all right, well, we know that it's hard and we know what the systems 
do. These systems aren't just things that happened 100 years ago. There are systems in, in effect that are continuing harms today. But despite those things, here are some tools, here are some ways of being that can allow you to continue to have hope and move through the world and have optimism. Um, and those are hard conversations because, again, those systems are still acting on us. Like, we just, like, the, the reason that Detroit looks the way it does, the vacancy that we see, this wasn't something that happened 30 years ago. It happened within the past decade, much of it. So it's like the, the harm is raw, the trauma is raw, and people have every right to be both angry, um, to feel traumatized and be working through that. And there aren't really clear uh, community systems to help collectively heal. And so it takes programs and one-on-one -on -one conversations. And you know, I talk about therapy, which is something that's not often talked about in the black community as well. Like I, I think that it's something that helps a lot of people heal. So it's just really working through those systems um, and giving people, not giving people agency and not empowering people, but allowing them to see the agency that they already have. If others of you want to comment on this, I'd love to hear from you. But I also know we have some questions from the audience that are going to be presented to me. Thank you. I think it's also important uh, that Detroiters, uh, through through my work, I, am, I employ uh, the desire to see Detroiters um, take that energy that they possess, whether it be from trauma, whether it is hope, whether it is a pain point, and enact that right right where they are. So right in their very own neighborhood. Um, and if they aren't able to, beginning to combat the things that are stopping them from doing that. Because ultimately, I think that it's not being able to see that as a possibility, much like buying a half million dollar house on the block in your neighborhood that was just completely vacant. It, it's also hard to see how success happens around you if you don't feel like those avenues are open to you. So that it's important, you know, for people to be able to look on their very own block and see, oh, like I can actually do this. Like for us, East Eats was saying to the to the whole neighborhood, hey, buy a side lot, combat the city on land use, talk with the city and work with them and see how we can continue to get these opportunities open to residents that are, you know, one, that have this opportunity available to them, right? The side lot program through the Detroit Land Bank. And like, for example, like East Eats could also have been someone who bought a shipping container, renovated it, and it was their very own barbershop next to their house. And the rest of it was a parking lot for their patrons, right? That provides hope. It helps to stop what we call the, the brain drain, right? When you're a person who feels that they have a lot to offer, and they don't feel like the opportunities here are vast beyond working a nine to five for a corporation that they may or may not want to work for. Quick and loose. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> if, if they don't They're want- are not sponsoring to, today's event, so it's okay. <laughs> but I'm just, you know, then they look elsewhere, right? And often elsewhere means somewhere else outside of not even the city, the state. And so by providing many exemplars for how people can utilize the space and the land and opportunities that may not even be currently open to them to their advantage, you empower people and it makes them want to stay because they feel as though they belong. Mm -hmm. That's important. I just wanna make one quick point. I think it's, for me, less about teaching or guiding or empowering Detroiters to remove the resentment or to get over it and whatever. It's giving them the tools and really meeting them where they are. Um, so when we talk about engagement, yeah, going door to door, talking to them about all the resources that exist in the city. There's a huge information disconnect, I think, that's happening right now as growth and development is taking place in various areas. And yeah, there's a digital divide too, so don't expect Posting things on social media or on the website, people are going to know anything or even care enough to go look it up. So I always say this, um, even when I'm in you know spaces within city departments, it's like it is not enough. It is not enough. So if you expect people to come and meet you and give you information and tell you their stories, that's disrespectful. Um, take all the resources, go door to door, teach people, uh, and be patient and be proactive and don't stop there. That's what I meant by the continuous pro being proactive, but also not stopping the community engagement once you've gotten what you needed. Continuously engage people. 
Um, and yeah, I think, you know, I'm gonna keep sounding like a broken record, but you, I think I need to drive the point home in these spaces because it just, we're not there yet. There's a question from the audience that I think ties in nicely to some of the things that you've said. Um, there is a lot of distrust that comes from outsiders having come in and, you know, taking what they want and then moving on. And, and, and because of that distrust, have any of you experienced challenges in getting buy-in from your communities and getting participation from your communities? It's like, oh yeah, another project, but we, we, we've seen how these projects go. And even though you're not outsiders, but, but does that transfer over to, 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 to you as fellow Detroiters? Absolutely, I've seen it on both sides. So when we built East Eats, before anyone saw who we were, they thought we were white. So when they saw domes and uh, shipping pallets, <laughs> they were like, oh, who are these white people on the east side off East Jefferson messing with our neighborhood? So they were constantly at the door like, what y'all doing? <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, hey, hi, I live here, and I'm the owner, nice to meet you. And their eyes got so wide, and the conversation went on from then. But it was beautiful to see, right? But I think that if I were not, who I am to like just racially <laughs> as well as a member of the neighborhood or a resident of the neighborhood, I think you would have been met with a lot of different uh, pushback on that by the neighborhood, right? On the flip side, I've also seen where if, for example, going back, this is 20, 17, Detroit Black Restaurant Week. I'm trying to get Detroit Black Restaurant Week off the ground. I'm engaging with black restaurant owners at the time. And I'm like, hey, I got this idea. Let's do Detroit Black Restaurant Week. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I'm not trying to alienate any of my customer base. Um, what, what tell me more, but I don't know, right? It was questions, lots and lots of questions, right? And these are black restaurant owners where black restaurant week is supposed to benefit them. And it's a highlight of their ownership, not of their customer base, right? So, so, so now we're, we're doing a social project. Two Instagram influencers, one white, one Asian, go out on behalf of me and try to engage with black restaurant owners about Detroit Black Restaurant Week. And next thing you know, my list is full. And so you see it happen on both sides where people will question something because it may seem as though it's an outsider, but it also may validate something for them by the fact that it's an outsider. So I was wondering if the worry was that we advertise Detroit, Detroit Black Restaurant Week and that outsiders think, oh, this is interesting. I'm, I'm going to go to Detroit Black Restaurant Week so I can tell my friends that I did something like really interesting. And, 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 and was, was that the worry? Or it's a because kind of the thing? concern was that by participating in Detroit Black Restaurant Week that, quite frankly, white patrons would think that they were not welcome when, in fact, it was the opposite. We want them to come and help us celebrate these black restaurant owners who, in many cases, have stuck it out through um, economic downfall here in the city, who have been here for years, far beyond many of the establishments that you see that are, that are in existence today downtown. And so the point was to gain support. It was never to alienate, but I think that there was such a concern for alienation of both themselves as well as their customers that the worry outweigh the benefit mm -hmm. to them until they saw someone with a face like the patron that they were so concerned about vying for the opportunity. And it's sad, but I understood the psychology of it, which is why I even tried it. Because I was like, I bet if I just send somebody in there that doesn't look like me, they'll say yes. And was I right? Yes. <laughs> so, you know. It's unfortunate, but it happens on both sides. Again, it's, a, it's about the approach. So um, we, we do need the, we do, we do need allies in everyone, you know, uh, in order for us to move this needle forward, this diversity and equity, equity and inclusion topic that has become trendy now, we do need everyone. It wouldn't be, it's Detroit Black Weed and it's only for black people. No, we need to, um, 
empower these black-owned restaurants and you know just show our support. And it's, it's the same thing uh, with, with my experience. Um, I got to where I am partly because of white men. I'm in the industry of architecture. That is pretty much the face of that is white male. So they are the ones in the leadership positions. They are the ones that are in the firms um, and in the organizations that pretty much shape and control our industry. And um, even though I started out my career working for a black architect, um, as I grew outward and um, just kind of tried to spread my wings, I became a project manager because my um, mentors did not look like me. So a lot of times, uh, that is my word of advice that, you know, you just, that's what you do. You, you mentor someone that doesn't look like you, you support someone that doesn't look like you. Um, there, were, there was a time, I wouldn't say that I experienced distrust, but I have just always been very uh, cautious about making sure that I was genuine, even though I might have worked at um, a firm that was predominantly white or went to a school that was predominantly white. Um, I was not becoming the token person that they would send out into my neighborhood. I was not about to do that. So there were times when I was just a fly on the wall at a community engagement event, just, you know, take a step back and, and fold my arms and watch these people from this neighborhood show that they are upset that no one came and talked to them or worked with them alongside them, but just came and designed at them and not alongside them and wants to come and just, you know, oh, this is what we've designed and it should go right here and, and this is why. That, that approach, like, I wouldn't be on board with that. So I've always been very vocal about whether, whether, wherever I work, I'm not going out to do that. So I haven't been put in a position where I, I was not trusted. Um, I think people in this city see themselves in me and I see, them, see myself in the kids that I mentor here. Uh, and I think that's why it's been easier for me to make the connections that I have. Um, but, you know, it's just really about uh, how to go about getting the support you need and being genuine about the support that you want to provide. I would like to add to that. I really appreciate what Tiffany had to say. I think the real challenge, I know for me, uh, especially not being born in Detroit, and that's the thing, like, there is a real there's a real thing here about being a Detroiter. I am so careful about like claiming Detroit because I know that's like I, I, I was like I have to explain it every time, and I and I and I and I do it with 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 all respect because I know that that's a real thing. But that's that's a side note. I, the thing that I really appreciated about what Tiffany said is that the real challenge is not taking the carrot that is offered because there are a lot of offers especially just as a black male in this city, there are a lot of offers like, hey, do you want to make this money? All we need you to do is to do this thing, play this performance here, be just be the face of this thing, we'll give you this money. And that, it's the, the, the thing that I think people may not understand is like, it takes a lot of real integrity and, 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 and real belief in what you do to not take those offers. Um, specifically for me, the culture is just too important. The reason why I moved to the city was to heal. That, that is why I'm here. So when people come to me and they're like, oh, I'm so happy you're in Detroit and doing the work that you're doing and, and doing all these things that are so good and you're doing and it's putting, it's like, no, you got it all wrong. I, I, am, I am here for what the city has to offer me. There is so much beauty and so much richness in this city that is I'm just thankful to even be able to say that that I'm a part of. You know what I mean? Um, that's that that in itself is worth protecting, and and it and and now that I am in somewhat of a leadership role, and these things are offered, it is even more important now because it's very easy to really mess up a whole thing <laughs> uh, just, for, just by chasing that dollar. You know what I mean? So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that. Put that. No, I appreciate that. John? Okay. Yeah. Just, just to add, though. So it, it, it's, it's, it's really good to, to, to hear the narratives and, 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 the, and unpack the stories. But if you look at a macro level, so if you begin to look at who are the executive officers of Fortune 100 companies in Detroit, and we have quite a few Fortune 100 companies. To Tiffany's point, like who are, 
you know, the executive officers in architecture firms or for me for law firms, like most of them are white men. And we are, we are still in an 80%, 90% black and brown city, right? And when you begin to look at the power structure, which is not black and brown, like you begin to understand what we were talking about earlier about what's that sense of, can I actually affect change in my city? It's like, sure, we have black people who work in roles, but do they actually have power to affect change? And oftentimes, and when you, and when you talk to them in private, right, amongst ourselves, like we know the, we know the answer, right? And it's, it, it can make one feel small, it can make one feel powerless. So even those who, we, who some might perceive to have power in the black community, you know, when you talk to them, they might not actually, may not actually have power. So, you know, this is a perception that a, a lot of those who are in these circles, we understand, it's just like, no, you know, this goes so deep that there's so much in the system that needs to be um, dramatically altered. What, ki what do we do about those systematic changes that are needed? I mean, when we talk about systematic change and structural change, it can often feel overwhelming. We have a, a question. Um, and, and, it, and several um, people who are asking questions sort of tied this into the race thing. You know, how, how do we bridge the racial divide? How do we get um, insiders and outsiders to work together? Or do we even do that? Is, is that part of the goal? Are, are, is there a role for outsiders? Is there a role for people who did not grow up here? Is there a role for white Detroiters given the way um, those approaches can be problematic. I'm always going to jump in if nobody else, else does. So I'm just going to look around first. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was asked to be an expert contributor to a book called Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design. It is not only about architecture, but about the users of spaces, about the users of mechanical systems and gaming and all types of things. And again, this was an author who um, became a, a good friend of mine. She was a CEO position at Microsoft and at Google and at Salesforce. And she came here to learn about my experience um, because my experience in architecture was exclusion. I did not feel like I belonged from the point I walked into school for it, even though uh, I was always a lover of art, I was always drawing, I loved woodshop, all these things, and just even though I wasn't even exposed to architecture growing up, they all played a part in uh, becoming, being able to make it through college. So um, I think if we just take uh, a minute, um, as, as a community, whether you, no matter what race you are, no matter if you are from here or not, uh, I think, there are a couple points from that book that, that I talked about. Uh, the first one is just recognizing points of exclusion. The point of exclusion that I experienced, and, and this can be applied to any um, situation. Uh, getting to Lawrence Tech and, and not having um, been exposed to architecture, but my classmates had parents who were architects or had internships at firms. Uh, there were a lot of things that I didn't understand, even uh, having to do with the way that I learned. So if architecture is kind of a very exclusive type of thing to study, um, because it's just this noble thing to take on the built environment in the world, and you, you're responsible for the life, health, and safety of the public. Um, I didn't feel like I belonged there. And I didn't have any instructors that looked like me, and I didn't have, learn about any architects that looked like me. But just recognizing those points of maybe you might have, um, the, well, the second point is to identify uh, situational challenges. I had not been on a college campus either. So someone from Lawrence Tech came to Northwestern where I graduated and um, just talked about architecture when I was in 12th grade, and I was there in the fall studying architecture. Uh, and so you might have someone in your class that uh, this might be their first time learning, learning about this topic. Um, another, or the third point that I usually make, and there are several of them, but I'm, I usually try to keep it short, which I'm not that good at. Um, just recognizing personal biases. So if you're there and you're there to offer a solution to a problem, 
you have to remove your own experience or your own needs or your own expectation or assumptions to what this person or this group of people or this problem needs. Uh, so those, those are the three things, like those are the approaches that I think can take to like really unify um, an approach to any problem. It's not just architecture. And, and the book you recommended again is? It's called Mismatch, How Inclusion Shapes Design by Kat Holmes. We have a question from online. It's a very specific question. I'm working to build a co-housing community. Are there strategies for reaching out to more Detroiters who might be interested in joining the project, and are there organizations we should partner with? I'm sorry, do you repeat that? <laughs> yeah. I'm working to build a co-housing community. Are there strategies for reaching out to more Detroiters who might be interested in joining the project, and are there organizations we should partner with? My first question is where? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's a, and that's a good good question to right. ask. Where? Yeah. Because then that's how you identify who the key stakeholders are in those communities, who are the influencers, who are the people that you need to reach out to, the churches, any other religious institutions, the libraries, whether or not they're open, because I know the one in my neighborhood isn't, um, the schools, the youth groups. Um, I don't think we talk about youth enough. When we talk about urban development, when we talk about change, I think we need to, um, they need to be decision makers at the table because it's their future, it's our future, however you define youth. Um, so yeah, it really depends on the community um, and um, you really need to identify those people and keep talking, keep asking them who else do, needs to be here, who else do I need to include, whose perspective am I missing until you, till you get almost everyone and you continue to do that. That's my short answer. I appreciate your saying about not talking about youth enough, because one of the things that struck me when you were talking is that you, you didn't have a, an image of what it was to be an architect, and yet somehow you managed, you know, gr growing up, you didn't have architects in your family and so on, somehow you, you managed to get there, and uh, presumably part of that was finally getting that exposure, and, and that's so important, you know. So I, I couldn't agree with you more about including youth at the table. We, we pretty much skip over that group of people as a voice that should be at the table. So um, I wouldn't say, you know, just, I would like to, there are, there are a lot of design schools popping up in the city now, um, whether it be elementary, middle, or high school. We don't always have to go to university. So if, if someone's looking to develop a co-housing um, project and wants to, to know who to go to, I think I would start with the city because the city has um, been broken up into districts, and there, there are all these dis different managers that kind of, and it goes back to where they're, where they're saying, um, or what area they're trying to go to. But I think the city is doing a little bit of a better job with connecting these types of projects to the people that they need to be connected with. Uh, and I don't, I'm not saying that because um, I have friends that work there, but there have been times when the city was doing a horrible job, uh, and I have friends that work there. So. <laughs> This is actually very relevant to this, this next question, and we have time for a couple more questions, and then we want to go for reception. And also, I'm going to ask you to give me a number between 1 and 30, and I'll explain why later. Just a random number between 1 and 30. 11. 11, okay. So this next question, the city of Detroit is trying to include people into the planning process for neighborhoods for developing a new master plan. What's your advice to make this a success? Well. Oh, and, and the second part, yes, how, I wonder whose question this is. The second part is, how will you help? Yeah. So, so it's interesting because, in, in, in fact, the, uh, the person who would lead that initiative last week said that we would not have a master plan revision. Um, and just for those who know, I mean, most cities revise the master plan fairly regularly. This is, this is a plan that includes um, neighborhood maps, uses, is, is really a visioning document for the whole city, for neighborhoods throughout the entire city. That has now, constant change. That has constant change. So we have not updated ours in, <laughs> it's been a long time. Um, supposed to do it every 10 years by charter. We haven't done it in, in, in way over 10 years. So we've been doing these smaller neighborhood planning studies, um, which are a little bit cheaper, um, a little bit more discreet, but to do a full master plan would be a million, 1.5 million probably more, which we can find as a city, but there also takes political will, which I don't think you know we currently have. So 
to make it a success, we need to do it. <laughs> we need to find the political will to actually do it. Um, but once, once, it's, once, it was in, once it starts, right? We've, we've done something like this before. Um, it was a little controversial, though. So Detroit Future City, back during the Bing administration, actually did a really far-reaching citywide initiative to find out what Detroit residents wanted in their neighborhoods. Um, this was because of the failure of government that we had a institution outside of government do it, but there is an example of what that could lead to um, and how you have long-term, multi-year conversations across the entire city with all of the residents, as many residents as possible, you know, including youth, all different generations, including all different communication types, so not just paper surveys, not just online, but SMS, door knocking, to the earlier point. Um, it really is an extensive process that takes many, many years, but um, I don't think that we have the political will. Did you also want to play in on that? 100% agree with everything you just said. But to answer the question before that about, which kind of alludes to the same, uh, this question as well, which is the future of Detroit, Detroit you know, how do we um, make sure, everything that we're talking about, engaging people, and I think from my perspective, having worked for city council, I think policy and legislation is very important. Uh, there's a limited amount of, um, I guess, standards that are set in the city whether when it comes to growth and development. At this point, we don't have a development, like a set of development standards when a big company or a big project comes into the city. We don't even have environmental standards that these companies have to follow. And so I think we need to start there. Um, and we get pushback for that as well. Um, you might wonder who, right? Um, and so I think really policy and legislation is really important. I, when I say policy, I mean internal policy, the way that departments run themselves, but also the legislation that guides the cities. I think, um, yeah, I think setting those standards up is the first step. Um, uh, kind of uh, talking about uh, zoning and neighborhood planning studies. So uh, my role when I was with the city council was policy focused, but also I did a lot of capacity building work with neighborhood organizations. So I had a, you know, a list of probably like 50 to 100 churches, neighborhood groups, leaders that I worked with one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to give them the tools that they need uh, to get to the next level. And what I realized in an area called Midwest, uh, people don't know when or how that neighborhood name came about, which is another issue. Uh, how people recognize their neighborhoods, what they call them, is a really important part of the change that's happening in the city. Um, Anyway, uh, the neighborhood um, really didn't have anything, and we realized that there was a lot of eyes on this area, especially with the Joe Louis Greenway coming in, right? And so what we did was uh, reach out to Wayne State and the Urban Planning Department um, to get um, their students to work on a framework plan in the interim until the city can gather the money and the resources and the staff to, to do one, which is happening right now. Uh, but we were able to complete one uh, so that the, the community has something in their hands that they can carry, you know, to give them, I think, a sense of legitimacy about their vision and their priorities for the community. And so when development comes in, they can say, you know, this is what we need. We've already, we've already talked. We've already, you know, collaborated. Here's what we're looking for in our communities. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, that's the approach um, that should be taken in neighborhoods, in communities that don't have those types of resources or are not taking precedent uh, over other neighborhoods that are getting, you know, more uh, funds or attention or, you know, so just wanted to make those two points. Thank you. I'm going to ask one last question before we break for the reception, but, uh, and it's going to be the sort of forward-looking question. What do you all see for the future? Are you optimistic? What's... Uh, what are you worried about? What, what, what does the future look like to you? But before I do that, I want to announce the winners of the raffle. Um, online raffle winner was Mame Jackson. So we will arrange to get a book to you. And you gave me the number 11, and I counted 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. You just won the book. Yeah, yes. I'm so excited. I want to get a book filled <laughs> Okay, very good. <laughs> So what do you all see for the future? I'm not going first this time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll take it up first. Um, so uh, 
one, this book gives me hope because of all of the work that the people in this book are doing. But these, but every the 100 Detroiters in this book are just s symbolic of the tens of thousands of Detroiters who are doing really good work in neighborhoods. Um, and again, I feel like there are so many people who understand their own power and agency or exercising it within community. So that that gives me hope. Um, and you know, I'm not. I'm usually not a uh, municipal government apologist, but you know, we there, there are some there are some systems that have improved, right? We've we've seen these last ten years. I think that there is, you know, we have a new planning director who is is, is very ta very talented. Um, we have we have new talent, right, that wants to get it right, um, and I think that that sort of, despite the challenges, that sort of goodwill is a good starting point. So um, I'm hopeful as this decade continues to unfold that we're uh, able to really attack some of the challenges that we're facing. Okay, since you insist, check. Um, so, uh, our director of city planning is one of my good friends. He moved here from Houston by way of New York. And I had to just um, forewarn him that as someone from another state coming to be director of city planning of Detroit, you will have a problem. You know, everybody did it. The person before him had a problem. So uh, it was just, I think the future of the city just, is, it's, gonna, it's gonna need to be collaborative. It's gonna need to be inclusive. Um, there's a lot of new construction, uh, new initiatives, new people here, and it needs to include the people who made the culture of this city who it is. No one should be on the news saying that they don't feel like this neighborhood is welcoming to them and they live across the street, you know, from a development that's going up. Like, I, I have a problem with that, but uh, I, I can see the change in that because there are some groups of people in these entities, in these, um, in these uh, organizations that are trying to do their part to make sure Detroit is inclusive. So um, that is the future that I hope to see I hope that more people uh, learn more about this book because it could also help people learn about themselves, especially people, especially Detroiters. So um, one, one of my major takeaways from this book was learning about my um, DNA. Obviously, I didn't need a DNA test to tell me that I was um, more than likely from Africa, but to know <laughs> that um, my, where, where it, what proportions and from where it really led me to a life journey of my own. So learning that I was from West Africa and mostly Nigerian, I went to Africa, went to Morocco and Nigeria um, for two weeks in November, and it was just life changing, you know. And I know there are a lot of full circle moments in my life that it was either architecture or something, you know, some person that I've met that came into my life that took me to these points. But um, just being able to be vocal about. Uh, who I am and being proud that I'm from here. I know Detroit made me who I am. I know Detroit gave me the, the skin, the tough skin that I needed to make it in an, um, an industry like architecture and construction where there are just nothing but men, you know? So I'm um, just happy to showcase that and I'm just hoping more Detroiters, no matter what they look like, uh, can find that in them, no matter how old they are, can find that in them and, and groups like ours can nurture that to help them get there and being part of this future? Um, I'm very hopeful um, in general, um, but I'll say that this book um, has provided hope in such a way that um, when you look at the author, right, when we, when we talk about Marcus, um, this for me has been one of the few examples I've had where a white person was handling the information of black people and it was handled well. Like, when I say the information, this is DNA, right? We're talking about, it wasn't, this isn't, I mean, we gotta think back, right? We all, I hope, are aware of who Henrietta Lacks is, right? A white person handling something that belongs to a black person poorly, right? I've seen that example. And so when we even go back to the question of, are white and black people engaging with, with each other here? Or how does that look? How does that, I think that as a, as a white person, if you know that the work that you're doing is either involving, utilizing, or impacting people of color, you better make sure 
that those same people of color are benefiting, involved, heard, and represented in whatever you're doing. And I think what was so beautiful about this book is that you saw so many times where, just as you were saying, that you know we were ready to like hear from Marcus. Like I'm like, oh, tell me about yourself. <laughs> I want to know. And he was like, no, 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 no. Tell me about yourself. I want to know why it is. I want to know why, why you're here. I want to know the more intimate details around why it is that you do what you do, right? And so in so many ways, I was like, OK, like I'm driving now, you know? Instead of me just kind of like being taken, taken along a journey that's supposed to be my own, right. Yeah. right? And so I think that to answer that question that was previously asked, but also to talk about hope, it's, there was a point in my life when I thought that integration was a horrible idea. I'll be so honest, because I knew that historically, black people on paper did way better for themselves on their own than when things came together. It was that resources were being withheld from those actions, right? So it's not that those people were incapable, it's that they were unable because of the resources being depleted in their neighborhoods, right? And in their, in their work, right? But when, when, I, when, I, when I see things like this, when I look at this audience and see the fact that it's, it is mostly white people, I, I see hope in that. I see hope in the fact that there's a hunger for knowledge around this topic. I see hope in the fact that there are people that are actually interested in making sure that the narrative is written correctly. Because erasure is real. We know this. To, to erase the history of a people is to erase a people. And so this book gets it right, and it gives me an immense amount of hope because it gets the story right. And I hope that people will just continue to do work that gets the story right. Thank you. Marcus, you want to go first? OK, because I've been talking more than you. <laughs> um, Thank you all so much. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was down in Atlanta. We were visiting the Atlanta Beltline. I hadn't thoroughly in, kind of explored Atlanta before, but in a lot of ways, it's very similar to Detroit. And uh, I went there a couple days before my team arrived. It was like a, a, a team trip. And uh, my Lyft driver dropped me off. And I just so happened to be in an Airbnb next door to an abandoned house. And I was like, oh, I'm home, thank God, you know? <laughs> Uh, and my Lyft driver was like, are you going to be OK? You know, this is the rough part of town. And I was like, I'll be fine. You know, I'll take care of myself. Um, but I share Atlanta to say that uh, because we're working on the Joe Louis Greenway here, which I recommend everyone to look it up, joelewisgreenway.com. It's like a network of trails, more than trails, about economic development. It's about, you know, urban healing. Um, uh, but Atlanta's learning from its lessons about that project that they did. Because they were still talking about certain neighborhoods, you know, in a in a connotative way, in a bad way, almost looking down on them, like don't go there, you know, that's the greenway, you know, the belt line's not there yet, uh, and I think they made a lot of mistakes along the way, and it's been what almost 15, over 15 years since that project has started, and to just see that that conversation and that you know approach is still happening you know, shook me. I was I came back and I was like, listen, we need to not do that. <laughs> we need to do better. Um, and so I'm hopeful in the sense that we have a bit of time to c correct uh, and to do things better here in terms of policy, in terms of legislation, in terms of the way that we approach community development. Um, and I think, yes, this project is one of the ways we tell those stories in order to drive these dialogues, in order to drive the development. But um, I think, um, you know, we, we need to listen to what we've been continuously hearing from Detroiters, which is we want to continue in our homes, want to stay in our homes, we want to stop foreclosures, essentially want to stabilize home ownership, right? 
We want to promote small business development from the communities, provide people with the tool. We want to remove blight. We want to take care of all the blight that's happening in the city without compromising the sale of land and to certain speculators and to certain entities. We want to maintain that and continue to give Detroiters access to this land first and foremost. Um, and so we know their priorities. We just need to act on them. And I think that's where we are as a city. Um, you know, let's talk talking about listening and listening, continue to do that, but also put things into action. And I think moving forward, it's, a, it's really about accountability. Um, and with that accountability, I think we'll bring, bring the, the healing full circle. Because I think that's what Detroiters are looking for at the end of the day, from the city, from people who are new here. I don't think Detroiters are against development or, or new Detroiters. They just want respect and they want their needs met in their communities. It's very simple. And I think continuously talking about it as if it's this far-fetched goal is really obsolete and, and not effective. We need to be action-oriented. We need to drive it with policy. And we need to get these things going. Um, but um, sorry, that felt like a tangent, like a little speech. But really, I think that's, that's the way to go. And I'm hopeful. Thank you. Marcus? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm an optimistic at heart. So uh, I, I, I get a chance to work with, uh, I've, I've worked with a lot of youth organizations um, and, and, and still do and get to hear a lot of young musicians and see what they're working on and see what they're creating. And it inspires me to see the futures that they're developing and, uh, and that they're, the, not only are they developing, but the, uh, the connection that they have to the tradition of the culture that is here, uh, that is a really beautiful thing to see. Uh, and there's also something really interesting happening right now with artists uh, my age, where I think before it was like, if you wanted to make art, you, you had to go to New York or you have to go to LA, you have to go to these other cities. And I feel that I am seeing something now where there's a lot of younger 20-somethings that are from Detroit making music, staying in the city because they see very interesting opportunities and interesting creative situations um, that they can make happen, which is also very inspiring to me. And then I'm also inspired because I'm also seeing a lot of uh, our elders getting the respect that they deserve. I'm seeing a lot of our elders being taken care of by a younger generation and, and, and the younger generation reaching out to those people that have done the work and have been here and have really, you know, blood, sweat, and tears into, into their music and into their craft and into the city. They're reaching out to them, asking them, how do they do it? Um, how, do, how do we continue to sustain what it is that we're doing? Uh, that, all of that gives me a lot of hope. And, you know, uh, I feel that just on a on a larger on the larger side of things to see the investment in the culture of the city uh, and then to also hear um, what's what's going on on a more urban planning level and on a more economic level uh, uh, it's it's hard to say where which way this thing's going to go but it's definitely going to be interesting and I'm excited to be here to see what happens. And I'm excited to listen all the way through and document it and to be here with this wonderful panel that's here. So, yeah. Thank you so much. I am so grateful uh, for today's event and grateful to so many people. Um, I want to acknowledge a few people be before we close out. I want to thank again Governor Thompson and also acknowledge that Wayne State University Provost Mark Kornblue uh, ha has joined us. Uh, Governor Barnhill had to leave. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Alumni Association for partnering with the Irvin D. Reed Honors College to put together today's event. I want to thank my colleagues, Dr. Brian Ellis and Dr. Beth Fowler, for the amazing course they put together based on the I Detroit Project and for organizing today's event. I want to thank our media and communications team who uh, have helped us reach all of the people on Zoom at home. I want to thank um, Marcus Lyon for this beautiful work of art he has given us and that has worked with us uh, to create. 
And of course, I want to thank each and every one of you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you very much.